Let's solve a legendary JEE advance question. It is known as one of the hardest questions to ever appear. We have two circular discs of mass M and 4M. This length here L is given by root 24 of the radius A. This question involves some of the trickiest parts of physics, one of which is rotational mechanics, which is very, very hard to visualize, and multiple choice questions in which we have to decide which of the statements are true. So let's examine the first statement. The center of mass of the assembly rotates around the z-axis with an angular speed of omega over phi. It's really important to understand that in this problem there are two types of rotations that are happening. First of all, both of these discs are spinning around this axis but also they're rotating around the origin, similar to this container that I found in my office in an attempt to visualize this problem. A really important part of this problem is that both of these discs are spinning without rolling. Now, what does that mean? For one revolution of each of those discs, the distance that's been traveled by them will be equal to their circumference. Let's take the smaller disc. In one revolution, this disk will linearly cover a distance which is equal to 2 pi a. Well, how many revolutions will it take for this disk to go all around the z-axis? We can find that fairly easily by looking at this distance. We know that this is L and we know that this is A. So this here will be given by L squared plus A squared. And we know that L is root 24 of A. Therefore, this will be 25 A squared, which is equal to 5a. Now with the time pressure of the JEE advance, we should really recognize that this circumference here will be five times as large as the circumference of the disks, which means that for the same linear speed, it will take us five times as long to cover the same distance. But because of that, our angular speed will have to be five times lower, therefore a is a correct statement. If you prefer to think of this mathematically, we can use that V is equal to R times omega. Now we can apply this first for the smaller disk of radius A, meaning that the linear speed will be given by a omega. And because we're rolling without slipping, this will also be given by the translational speed as this thing is moving around the larger circle. But because it is also rotating around the axis z, we can also say that this will be given by, let's call it big R omega, where this here is just a bigger radius, 5a, times omega, and let's call that omega z, and this will be equal to a omega. R is just equal to 5a, omega z will be equal to a omega, and this would mean that we can cancel these out and the angular speed with respect to the z axis will be just omega over 5. On to part B now, which is in my opinion the hardest part of this question. We need to figure out if the magnitude of the angular momentum of the center of mass of this entire assembly about the origin is given by this expression. So the angular momentum with respect to O will be given by the moment of inertia of the center of mass multiplied by the angular velocity with respect to the origin. Let's start off with the center of mass. We can just use the formula that this here will be given by the first mass, which is m, multiplied by its distance to the origin, which is l. Then to that, we're going to add in the second mass, which is just equal to 4m, and that is at a distance of 2L with respect to the origin. And then finally, we're just going to divide by the sum of the two masses, which is going to be M plus 4M, which is just 
5m, which is 9ml over 5m. The m's are going to cancel. 9 over 5 5 L. Center of mass is over here somewhere and because the center of mass is just a point we can use the moment of inertia formula for it that this is just equal to its mass times the distance towards the axis of rotation squared. So I don't know I'm just going to call that mr squared where the mass will just going to equal to 5m and the distance r squared will be 9 over 5l squared which will give me 81 over 25. 5L squared and this thing here will then just be equal to, let's have a look, it'll be 81 over 5M but remember L is root 24A 24 times A squared. Now this is starting to look suspiciously like the answer which is part of the reason why this question is so difficult but we've still not multiplied yet by the angular velocity with respect to the origin. The next part is really really tricky. Because we are spinning with respect to the origin we can use the right hand rule to determine the direction of the angular velocity with respect to the origin. The the diagram of the question says that the wheels are spinning this way which means that they're going around here which means that by using the right hand rule you can imagine my sort of fingers spinning across like this the angular momentum will be pointing sort of downwards but not fully downwards because the whole thing is spinning at an angle meaning that this finger or the angular momentum vector the orbital angular momentum momentum vector is going to be tilted a little bit like this by exactly the same amount. So I'm going to call this L0 for orbital angular momentum because it orbits the origin and this angle here will be just theta. This here is also the direction of this angular velocity which is omega naught in fact i can also just write omega naught with respect to the origin what we found in the previous part of the question was the angular speed with respect to the x-axis i'm going to call that omega z and now look at this we were and now look at this, we have a right hand triangle and we can figure out a relationship between omega z and omega naught. Because this angle here is going to be 90 degrees, we can write down that cos theta is equal to our adjacent, which is omega z divided by our hypotenuse, which is going to be omega naught. Okay, so omega naught will just be equal to omega z, divide that by cosine of theta. And now I can go back to this triangle here to actually determine a mathematical value for cos theta. So cosine of theta is equal to our adjacent, which is going to be L divided by the hypotenuse, which is just this length here, which by Pythagoras we found this to be 5a in the previous part of the question. So cosine theta will be given by root 24a over 5a i.e. root 24 over 5. Now let's plug that back into here and we're going to find that omega naught will just be given by omega z divided by root 24 and then we get a factor of 5 up here but remember in the previous part of the question we figured out that omega z is just equal to omega divided by 5 5 so this factor of 5 here will cancel and what we get is that omega naught is just equal to omega divided by root 24. Where we started off with is that the angular momentum with respect to the origin is given by the moment of inertia times omega naught. We have an expression for the moment of inertia 
and we also have an expression for omega naught. So what we get is that L naught will be I, which is 81 over 5m 24a squared times omega. Now dividing by root 24 will just give me a factor of root 24 here. And this expression is almost the same as this one, which is one of the reasons that makes this question so incredibly tricky. If I was to divide those two numbers, root 24 over 5, I get like 0 0.98 or something like that, which makes those two expressions super similar. And this is yet another reason why this question is so difficult, because we absolutely cannot eliminate this answer as a possibility until the very final step of this question. Finally, we can see that B is not correct by only a couple of percent. On to part C, the magnitude of the angular momentum of the assembly about its center of mass is 17 ma squared omega over 2. In the frame of reference of the center of mass, we only need to consider the angular momentum due to its spin. This will be given by the angular momentum of this thing plus the angular momentum of the larger disk. We don't need to consider the cylinder between them because the question says it's mass. So we can say that L center of mass, let's call it, will be the moment of inertia of the first disk times the angular speed plus the moment of inertia of the second disk times the angular speed again. Now the moment of inertia of a spinning disk is given by mr squared divided by 2. I presume that if you're taking this exam you need to memorize these, but let me know in the comments below. Okay, well, this thing will then be equal to the mass of the first one, which is m multiplied by its radius squared, which is a squared divided by 2, times omega plus i2, which is going to be given by 4m multiplied by its radius squared, which is going to give us another factor of 4a squared. We're going to be dividing that by 2 multiplied by omega. And this thing will then give us, well, on this side, we're going to have 16 over 2a squared omega times m plus another factor of the same, which is going to give me 17 ma squared omega over 2, which is identical to what we're given here. So c has got to be correct. Okay, let's have a look at the last last option. So the magnitude of the z component of the total angular momentum is given by 55 ma squared omega. So in the previous two parts, we've actually found two separate components of the angular momentum. In C, we found the spin angular momentum, which is along this axis. And by the right hand rule, if we're spinning this way, then it will be a vector which is pointing in this direction. So I'm just going to draw that over here. This is going to be our, let's call it LCM. And this is offset from the horizontal by an angle, which is theta. We found its magnitude to be this much. In part B, we actually found an expression for the orbital angular momentum, which will be down here if we're spinning this way in the same direction as omega naught. I'm just going to call that L naught. We're looking for the z component, just as in z physics, of the total angular momentum. Well, the total angular momentum is just LCM plus L naught, and each of them are going to have their own separate Z components. So this one here is going to have this one, which is the opposite, which is just L sine theta. And this one here will have its Z component, which is just L not cosine of theta. I should probably give this one the CM index. Notice that they're pointing in different directions. So this one is pointing down, whereas this one here is pointing up. If it was spinning the other way, the two directions will be reversed. But in both of those cases, we need to take them away to find the Z component. So, so I'm going to do L not cos theta, take away 
LCM sine theta. Okay, this will involve some algebra, so this will be equal to 81 over 5 m root 24 a squared multiplied by the cosine of theta, which in the previous part we found it to be root 24 divided by 5. Okay, now let's take away minus LCM, which is going to be 17MA squared over 2 times omega. And now we have to find sine theta again. So I need to go back to this triangle and sine of theta theta is going to be the opposite, which is a divided by the hypotenuse, which is just 5a, so that's just 1 over 5. So we get another factor of 1 over 5. So what do we get? 81 times ma squared omega, factor of 24 over 25. Take away 17ma squared omega over 10. Now, all I need to do is compare this with that to get the right answer. Now, 24 over 25 is pretty close to 1. So, this is, let's call that essentially equal to 1. So, it's actually a little bit less, which means that this here will be around 80 or a little bit below. And from that, we need to take away this factor of ma squared omega which is just going to be equal to 1.7. So the whole thing will be given by sort of 70 something ma squared omega, which means that that is very far off this. So this answer here is wrong. And we have finally solved one of the most fun questions to appear on the JE Advanced. Here are my thoughts on this question. Anytime we're dealing with angular momentum, it is tricky because this quantity depends on the point that we're taking it with respect to. And in this case, we have a very intricate situation with two types of angular velocities that can be actually really hard to get your head around in a small time frame. Additionally, we have a ton of calculations. I think part A and part C can be relatively accessible within the time frame after some very rigorous preparation, but I find part B and part D exceptionally difficult to get within that time frame. The first time that I encountered such similar questions, probably would have been in a course called Advanced Dynamics, which was during my first year of undergraduate studies of maths and physics. Not all the questions from this exam are this hard though, and you should have a look at this question next, which is a lot of fun and you'll really enjoy that.